Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, we're going to be talking about the special secret language that pilots and cabin crew use in order to communicate with each other during um, specific sp stages of flight. We're going to be talking about both how the system works and specific procedures that you might not be aware of. So make sure you stay tuned. This video is brought to you in cooperation with Brilliant.org. Now, Brilliant.org is a smarter way to become smart. They will help you to increase your mathematical skills and your physics skills. And the 501st of you who uses this link below will get 20% off the annual fee of Brilliant, but it's completely free to check it out. Right guys, if you have been a passenger on a 737 lately, you will probably at one time or another have heard or thought about these dings and ding-dongs that happened at irregular intervals throughout the flight. And you might have thought, hmm, I wonder what that is. Now, that is actually a fascinating system, something that uh, has been developed over years and years. And it kind of works like a secret code language between both the flight crew and the cabin crew and between cabin crew and cabin crew. So the system is an audio visual system. It means that there's both sound signals and visual light signals. And the light signals, you might have seen them, uh, they're situated both in the front of the cabin, next to the toilet, in the center, in the roof, in the center of the cabin, uh, and in the back, in the roof as well. It's a light fixture which has three different lights on it. And they are co connected to the, the different sound signals that you're hearing. Now, the reason that we do need a system like this is, well, there are many of them, but the main thing is that we have a huge communication barrier in the form of the locked cockpit door. So since we have a door that is completely locked throughout the flight, um, it's very hard for the cabin crew to communicate directly with us, the pilots, and for the pilots to communicate with the cabin crew. And during certain parts of the flight, what we call the sterile parts of flight, which is basically from pushback to uh, take off climb up until we're level, and from when we start descending down to when we're at the gate again, uh, there's not really any any time to communicate verbally with each other. So we have to have a system in force in order to be able to communicate messages in a simple way anyway. Now, I should mention as well, before I start giving examples of these procedures, is that they're very company specific. So each company is going to have different meanings to the signals, but the signals are largely the same. Um, the other reason, obviously, that we do need this system is because of the aircraft being very, very long and very noisy. So even though cabin crew could see each other, they can't really communicate from the front to the back. And they need to be able to do so fairly quickly, both in case of an emergency, but also just from day-to-day -day stuff, like if they want to, to get something from the forward galley to the back. Um, the, uh, the way that this system works is that if crew wants to communicate with each other, the cabin crew has a handset. Uh, there's one handset in the front, which looks like one of these old telephones that everyone used to use before they got mobile phones. Um, and it has a keypad on it. And that keypad will send out different messages depending on what keys they're using. Now, for security reasons, I can't go into the specifics of how to key in the different messages, but they are there anyway. So if the cabin crew in the back galley, for example, wants to communicate with the front galley, they will lift up the handset, they will press a specific button, that will send off a ding dong signal to the front and a pink light will illuminate in the, um, in the top. That will tell any cabin crew that's in that part of the aircraft that, okay, someone from the back wants to talk to me. And they will then lift the handset and when they lift it, that's going to reset the, the light signal. It's a similar thing if the, ca if the um, flight crew wants to talk to the cabin crew, they will use the cabin attendant button in the aft overhead panel in the cockpit, press that, that will also send a ding dong signal, but instead of illuminating either the front or the back, that is going to illuminate both the front and the back to tell the cabin crew that someone from the cockpit wants to talk to them. Um, if the passengers want to talk to the cabin crew, if you want to, well, buy something or if you want to tell them something, you, you remember that you have that cabin attendant call button on the top of your head. Now, if you press that once 
uh, that is going to illuminate a light over your seat and it's also going to illuminate the blue light. And it's going to illuminate the blue light in the front if you're sitting from the overwing exit towards the front of the cabin. And it's going to illuminate in the back if you're sitting behind there. So the cabin crew in each part of the aircraft knows that a passenger in my part of the aircraft wants something. And then they can just look down the cabin and they can see which light is being illuminated. Now to reset that you just have to press it again. That will reset the signal. And the third light signal is an orange light signal. And that only illuminates if someone in the toilets is pressing the attendant call button. So if you're sitting, you have a problem of some sort and you need to reach the cabin crew uh, from inside of the toilet, there's gonna to be a cabin attendant button there. You press that and it's going to illuminate the, uh, um, the orange light together with a single ding, just like the, uh, the sounds of the passenger call buttons. Okay, with me so far? Great. Now, there is also other sound signals. For example, when, uh, when the pilot puts the fasten belt on, the fasten seat belt sign on, that is going to have a single ding as well. Uh, and also, there is a system where the cabin crew, when they enter a specific code in the, lock, in the code lock for the um, cockpit door, it's going to send us different sound signals depending on what code they put in. So um, I can't go into the specifics of that, but it is also being used on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm going to give you some examples now. So how do we actually use this then? Well, first of all, when we are sitting in the cockpit, once we have confirmed how many passengers we have on board and we've checked that the load sheet is correct with the cabin crew, then the cabin crew is going to go out and they're going to lock the cockpit door. Now that door is going to stay locked for the whole flight through. Okay, but we don't really know, just because the cabin crew has locked the door, we don't know what the status of the cabin is. We don't know if passengers are still walking around, if people are trying to find places for their cabin luggage or, or what's going on. So before we can start pushing back the aircraft, we're going to need to have some kind of signal from the cabin crew that they're ready. And that comes in the form of them going up and entering a specific code in the uh, lock pad that gives us a chime in the cockpit. When we have, have that, and once again, this is very company specific. So in my airline, we are using the uh, no smoking sign button because the no smoking sign button uh, is a dead button. It doesn't have any function. And that's off when the cabin is not secure. And when the cabin crew gives that first chime to us, we put it in the middle position. And the middle position indicates that, yes, the cabin is now ready to push back, but they're not ready to fly. Because when everyone is sitting down, the cabin crew still have to give their safety demonstration to the passengers. So we will be pushing back, we'll be starting the aircraft up. And by the way, if you want to see how we do that in my Mentor Aviation app, I have a full setup from dark to taxi where I show all of these procedures for you. So if you're interested in that, get the app and get the collection. Anyway, we will take the, um, we'll start the engines. We will start taxiing out. We will do our before takeoff checklist. Uh, once the before takeoff checklist is completed, we are now ready to go, but we, we still don't know what the cabin is like. So what we do then is that we give one single ding to the cabin crew. That's us pressing the cabin attendant button that will send that ding dong sign to the cabin crew uh, and illuminate the pink um, visual signal. The cabin crew now knows that, all right, so the flight crew is ready to go. They will make sure that their safety demonstration and everything is done and the cabin is secure and they will once again enter a code into the keypad. When we get that, we will then move the um, no smoking sign to on as an indication that the aircraft is now ready to fly. So after that, we will take off. We will do our after takeoff procedure and we will release the cabin crew when we've done the after takeoff checklist. And we have seen, we've talked to each other and discussed whether or not it's appropriate to release the cabin crew. There might be weather around, for example, there might be um, turbulence. And if that's the case, we will not release the cabin crew for service. But if everything is fine, we will decide, yep, we'll release them. We'll press that cabin attendant button once again, which will send a signal out. And when we do that, we turn the um, fasten, sorry, the uh, no smoking sign back off, showing that now the cabin crew is out, they're working, it's not secure. Cabin crew will listen to that, they will start working, but once 
the, uh, but the, still, the passengers are not allowed to leave their seats because the fasten seatbelt sign is still on. That will be turned off, providing everything's okay once we pass 10,000 feet climbing in my airline. So at 10,000 feet, we will, if everything is fine, turn the belts to the auto position. So we don't turn it all the way off, we turn it to the auto position, and that's because it has features in it that will illuminate the fasten belt sign if we forget to put it on, like when we take the flaps and gear out, for example. Right, so then we will be flying along and uh, we will be coming up to our cruising level. And once we're in the cruise, then the cabin crew will at regular intervals call the cockpit. They will ding us, we will then, the one who is pilot monitoring is going to hand over the radio communication to the pilot flying and communicate with the cabin crew, saying everything is good, hopefully, and they can also give any message to us if a passenger is feeling unwell, for example, or anything like that. So that goes on for the entire flight. Then as we start descending, uh, and we descend into our destination, we need to start giving signs to the cabin crew that we are nearing landing. So at least 15 minutes to go before landing, we put the fasten belts on, and that's about 15,000 feet. So at 15,000 feet or 15 minutes, whichever comes earlier, we put the fasten belts on. So you will hear that and you will see that the fasten belt comes on. This is normally where the cabin crew also tells you that you cannot use the toilets anymore, that you need to sit down, that we're preparing for landing. And the cabin crew will then start to make sure that the aircraft is secure for landing. Now at about 10,000 feet descending, uh, the uh, pilot monitoring will do something called TAN checks, which I'll do uh, a better explanation of later on. Um, where they will give an actual take up the PA and actually give 10 minutes to landing. So cabin crew, 10 minutes to landing. That is the final kind of sign that you know we're getting ready to land, which means that the cabin crew has to finish up whatever they're doing, and then they have to go in and then once again use the keypad to give us the signal that the cabin is secure. When the cabin is secure, we will once again put the Foston for the uh, no smoking sign on because that would have been turned off as part of our after takeoff checklist. That will remind us that the cabin and crew is secure. We'll start our approach and at latest six nautical miles from the landing runway, the pilot monitoring will take the PA microphone up and say, cabin crew, seats for landing. Make sure that from that point, the cabin crew is securely seated in their seats with their seat belts on, ready for the landing. Of course, on top of that, we are making PAs. We do PAs. I do a welcoming PA as the captain um, in the beginning of the flight. During the flight, providing there is time, uh, we do a, um, an information PA about landing time, weather, where we are, and so on. The, the, but the only PA that is really, really necessary is the PA that we do when we're welcoming the passengers. It has to be done by the captain because we want to establish my voice so that the um, passengers recognize it in case we have to do an evacuation because the evacuation command will come from the captain as well. So as you see guys, as with everything, even though it seems random inside of the industry, dings that's coming at different intervals and so on, there is a very specific purpose behind them and they're all due to safety. As always, there is, you know, there's loads of these things and I'm going to continue to make videos about them to make, you know, to, to show you guys how much thought is going into the safety work within the airline industry today. I do hope that you like it. Send in your questions about this in the uh, um, description of the, or sorry, in the comments field below. Give me a like and make sure that you've subscribed and that you have um, entered the, uh, the little uh, notification bell. Because if you haven't activated the notification bell, you don't know when I'm releasing spontaneous videos like I did from the cockpit this week or uh, when I do live streams. Make sure you do that. Before I go, I want to say a, a really, really special thank you to the sponsor of this episode, which is Brilliant.org. Brilliant.org is really enabling me and my channel to continue to give you guys great content. And they, they are a really, really great tool, guys. If you want to increase your mathematical skills and your physics skills and you feel that, oh, the school is not really, you know, it's not really that fun. It doesn't really motivate, it doesn't give me the, the tools that I need to, to improve. Well, then Brilliant.org is something that you should really check out. They will give you not only ways to deal with problems, but specific techniques in order to think properly, okay? In order to think like a scientist, where you chuck the problem up into smaller bits, you solve each little bit, 
and together you get the solution of a potentially very complex problem, which is exactly the way that we work in the flight tech. If we encounter something um, like a very complex technical problem, for example. So use the link below, the 501st of you who do so will get 20% off the annual fee. But once again, it's completely free to check it out. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.